It's amazing what God can do. And even if we don't feel God's presence or we kind of wonder, where is God? God's plan for us is being worked out. So today I'm continuing in our series of of character footprints. So we're looking at different characters in the Bible and seeing what we learn from them and um, you know what uh, what impact God had in their life. Um, that camera's pointing over here. So if you're at home um, and you can't see me, it's all right. Okay, it's all working out wonderfully. Good, amazing what God can do. You can make miracles happen. Don't worry, we'll get work we'll discussed. Right, so um, today we're looking at the life and the character of Esther, Queen Esther, from the book of the same name in the Old Testament. And, and I'm taking my title today, getting some uh, noise from outside, hopefully you still hear me. So I'm taking my title, Making a Difference. Esther made a difference to her nation. God made a difference in Esther's life. And making a difference. How can we make a difference? Well, in in popular culture, uh, I'm sure you've got the commemorative tea towel or maybe the mug or the the screensaver on your laptop. Or um, maybe you find in your Facebook post, you get these kind of pictures of the starfish. And we have this uh, popular story, the, the starfish story, um, which is beloved by, um, uh, uh, by motivational speakers and explains how to make a difference. Um, let me quickly tell you that story because it's kind of a, um, uh, it's a story that helps to illustrate the point. So there's a man walking on, along a beach at dawn and he sees a young man reaching down picking up a starfish and throwing it into the ocean. The man walks up to the young man and says, what are you doing? The beach goes on for miles and there's hundreds of thousands of starfish washed up. Um, What are you doing? Um, You won't make a difference. And the young man reaches down, picks up another starfish throws it into the ocean and says, I made a difference to that one. Well, it's making a difference. I guess the point is, is that the, the little things that we do, whatever the odds, however you know, complicated or big or challenging an issue, the little things that we do make a difference. And in fact, this popular telling of the story, the story is called um, The Star Thrower. And it's a 16-page essay, not a kind of short little motivational kind of talk. And the real message is about the impact that the young man had on the older man who was walking on the beach. Because that man went home, reflected on what he'd learned, and was back the next day helping the young man throw starfish back into the ocean. And that one little throwing the starfish into the sea started to cascade um, with the older man coming down and maybe more people coming down. And one little action having much wider impact. The story is written by uh, a writer called Lauren Isley. It was published in 1969. The Star Thrower was the, uh, the essay. Well, we're going to look at Esther. And Esther made a difference in, uh, in her community And what I want you to learn today is that doing the right thing, however small it seems, in your Christian faith, as you walk out in faith, can have immeasurable impacts on those around you. However insignificant your action is, God can perform miracles with it. So when we do the right thing, when we make these little actions, they're multiplied by God, miracles can occur. When we reach out in compassion, can I pray for you? God can turn that around. He can turn it into lives being saved, nations being saved 
in the name of Jesus Christ. And when loaves and fishes are presented to Jesus, Jesus, through one of his many miracles, can turn that into feeding many people. Our little actions, however small they seem, can have a multiplied effect in the kingdom. So making a difference, and we're talking about Esther from the book of Esther. And here we have an account of a, a determined, prayerful, God-fearing orphan living in exile who gets elevated to be queen, Queen Esther. And she sets about saving the Jewish nation from extinction, from destruction, from, from genocide. So today's story is a story of, of, a story of courage, doing the right thing, regardless of the cost, speaking truth to power, and God's eternal, continuing plan to be with his people. Today isn't a message um, from the book of Esther. I don't have time to tell you the whole story and all of God's plan. Um, if you'd like to do that, I recommend you read the book of Esther. It's 10 short chapters. Uh, you could read that in one sitting uh, later today or during the week. Or you could go to the Bible Project online, bibleproject.com, and look at a short seven-minute video that shows you the structure and the meaning of uh, the book of Esther. But for now, a short, quick summary just so that we understand the context of, of Esther's life. So this all happens in the Persian Empire. And it happens to the, the remnant who remained in, in exile after Zerubbabel and Nehemiah and Ezra returned to Judah. And we learned all about that um, earlier on this year. Not all of the Jewish nation returned to, Jeru uh, to Judah. Um, some remained in, uh, in the Persian Empire. The king, King Xerxes, is running a colossal empire right from the Mediterranean coast of the Upper Nile in Egypt right over to India. Very wealthy king. Uh, he has 127 provinces. And to be honest, this king is a drunkard, a womanizer, and he's reliant on yes men who give him some really dubious advice. And one of his advisors, Haman, is a self-righteous kind of number two in the empire. Everybody should worship me. He's full of his own self-importance and he's got bad blood from his family. Uh, he fell out with the Jewish people way back um, when Samuel uh, killed his king. The God-fearing Jew, Mordecai, is living in exile, refuses to bow down to Haman, and that causes Haman to get into a right kind of rage, and he goes to the king and says, certain people in your empire are not treating you with respect. Please give me permission to exterminate them all. He doesn't tell the king that these are the Jewish people, but he just says certain people. And, and even more, king, I'll pay you 300 tons of silver. 300 tons of silver, if you allow me to do this. And the king, yeah, of course, do that. Don't pay me, but you can go and sort those people out. The day that that genocide is set to occur is determined by pulling lots out of an urn. So in this superstitious world, pull out the date from an urn, and this is an auspicious day. This is kind of like the fates have determined this day. And the day of the genocide is about 11 months in the future. Fate determines the day of the genocide. Meanwhile, 
as was common in uh, this society, um, the second and third generations of, um, of the um, people of Judah, the exiled people who have been taken into captivity in Babylon, they adopt, well, they have both a Jewish name and a Persian name. So a beautiful, attractive, highly respected young woman by the name of Hadasha, it's a Jewish name, um, took the name Esther, which is a Persian name, and um, as a little throwback to the starfish, the name Esther means star. You can remember the starfish and the star, Esther, star. Esther's an orphan, she's living in exile, and she's been brought up and adopted by her older cousin stroke uncle, it's not quite clear, um, named Mordecai. And that's the same Mordecai, the God-fearing Jew, who refused to bow down to Haman. Great things happened to Esther. Um, as a young woman, she's, she's selected to enter King Xerxes' harem and quickly becomes his favorite. And before you know it, Esther is elevated to the position of queen. And all through this, under Mordecai's guidance, Esther hasn't revealed the fact that she's from the Jewish nation. Well, things conspire together. So uh, now that Esther is queen, Mordecai reveals to her this plot of Haman to exterminate the Jewish people, um, or to exterminate these certain people. And he appeals to Esther to beg for mercy from the king. She's in a position to appeal to King Xerxes to, um, to spare the Jewish people. Without giving away all of the plot, of course, Esther makes a difference. She finds a way to appeal to the king who issues another decree to allow the Jewish people to defend themselves. And the Jewish nation are spared. And um, uh, this sparing is, uh, is celebrated today by the Jewish people in the festival of Purim. And every year, this saving of the Jewish people gets celebrated by Jews in a really um, wonderful um, holiday with feasting and kind of retelling the story, the festival of Purim. Okay, so that's the kind of setting and the story. Let's turn now to Esther and look at her life and her character and what, what we learn from, uh, from her behavior and her character. Well, Esther is resilient. She's got this inner strength that gets her through whatever happens to her in life. And you might look at the story of Esther, or you might see the um, uh, film or the, uh, the musical of Esther's life, and it's all about Esther's beauty and how she wins this beauty contest and gets elevated to queen, and everything's kind of wonderful. But where did Esther come from? Her family have been conquered, defeated, taken from Judah into exile. So she's, uh, she's effectively a refugee or she's a captive in, uh, in the uh, Persian Empire. She's an orphan. Her, her mother and her father have died and she's been brought up by her uncle or her cousin Mordecai. She suffered a great loss at this young age, lives in a land where they're not free and is brought up by, uh, by a relative. And then, because of her beauty, she's whisked away from her family and her friends and gets taken to the palace where she becomes one of the king's concubines. She enters the harem. We know what we mean when we say that she's one of the concubines. You know, she's brought into the king for um, his... Um, can't think of a polite way of saying it. Um, brought into the king um, to, um, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Lost words. Thank you. Yes, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, says, uh, says Steve. She, 
She must have felt alone, separated from all that she knew. Separated from Mordecai, who was a person who brought her up and taught her and, uh, and you know, looked after her at her point of, of need. And, and even when she's appointed to be queen, she must have felt conflicted because her nation, her people, her family were subject to this, uh, uh, this plot to uh, exterminate them all. And the man who'd issued that decree is King Xerxes, the man that has appointed her queen. So all through Esther's life, we see these trials and tribulations, and yet we see hope, hope running through her life. She's come from a lowly position, but shortly we'll see her willing to sacrifice everything that she has, risking her life to go in front of the king to plead for her people. In that culture, the queen isn't allowed to approach the king. She has to wait for permission to come before him. But yet she's prepared to go before the king and plead for her people. There's a real sense of God preparing Esther for for what's to come. And in, in our lives, our lives don't go smoothly. They don't go kind of in the way that we want we suffer trials and tribulations and we have things that are going wrong and we might think, where is God in what's going on in our lives? But God is present. We may not feel it, but God is present and he knows our path. He knows us. And we might turn to um, James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, when we're feeling kind of things are not going well. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So a trait of Esther that I want us to remember is her resilience, her simple trusting in God and her ability to get through what life and the cards that life dealt her. And secondly, I want us to think about Esther's humility. Yeah, she's a young woman when we meet her in the book of Esther. The first thing we learn is she's beautiful. Esther doesn't say anything that's reported in the book of Esther until the end of chapter 4. Things just seem to happen to her. She gets picked to join the harem. She receives a year of beauty treatment. Imagine that, a year of beauty treatments. Things just kind of happen. She goes with the flow. Things happen to her. She keeps her Jewish um, identity hidden. um, And she just follows what Mordecai has told her to do. She's attractive. She manages to fit in. She becomes well-liked. She keeps the peace amongst all the women in the harem. She doesn't ruffle any feathers. She goes with it. She fits in. And gets on with life. But I don't think we have a a, a passive, kind of inactive woman here. I think we have a a um, a humble woman showing humility. She's faithful to what her uncle, her cousin maybe taught her. She followed Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. And Esther, through her humility, makes a great impression on everyone that she meets. Despite her great beauty and being elevated to queen and becoming a favorite of the king, she doesn't fall out with anybody. And we read in uh, Esther chapter 2, verse 15, Esther 
won the favor of everyone who saw her. Imagine some of those um, uh, beauty contests, those kind of um, reality TV programs where uh, people are put in a competition in a, in a different environment. And the squabbling and the backstabbing and the falling out that goes on in there. In that kind of situation, Esther would just be friends and loved by everybody. She had an inner quality, a quality of um, humility that she sees the best in everybody else and considers herself low. And these qualities attract the king. Okay, she's very beautiful, but we read Esther chapter 2, verse 17. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. And I think in my reading, it's not only her beauty that attracts King Xerxes, but her whole countenance, her humility, her approach to those around her. That can be very, very beautiful. And even when Esther's elevated to be queen, she remains faithful to her people and to her family. And we read that Mordecai comes to the gates of the temple every day to meet Esther. So even though she's the queen's, fa- the king's favorite, and is uh, you know in this position of power, she comes to meet with Mordecai each day, no doubt to share news and to learn stories about what's happening to the people outside of the palace. Even after her elevation, she's not too important to spend time with her loving family. I think that's a lesson for me. And humility, what more example of humility is there that when Esther goes to the king and comes into his presence and the king knows that she's about to ask for something, he says, ask for whatever you want even if it's half the kingdom, Egypt to India, I'll give it to you. And the king says this, ask for what you want, and I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. This happens three times in three different occurrences. And how easy would it be for Esther to kind of see this wealth and see this power, and see this dominion that she could take on board. And yet, the only thing she cares about is her people, and saving her people. So she sticks with her plan, and asks the king to, uh, to save her people. Pride can be a trap for us. In this story, the qualities of Esther, we can contrast her humility with the self-important, ego-driven, vengeful, murderous, wealthy behavior of Haman, who wants to destroy certain people in the kingdom. But Esther's humility leads to God saving her people. What else does the Bible teach us about humility? Uh, We turn to the first book of Peter, chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 5 to 7, and in this, embedded in this, is, is a proverb. 1 Peter 5, verses 5 to 7. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 
God opposes the proud, like Haman, and shows favour to the humble, like Esther. Oh, and what about wisdom? Esther shows enormous wisdom. Let this be a lesson to us. All right, let's come back to Haman. You remember, he wants to settle this old score that he had against the Jews, and he's petitioned King Xerxes to issue this decree to allow him to exterminate them. The date when that happens is done by fate picking lots out of the urn. Just superstitious nonsense. Let's compare that to Esther's wisdom. She learns about the plot from her guardian, Mordecai, and uh, her servants. And suddenly we see a great resilience, great resolution in Esther. Mordecai is begging her to reveal the plot to King Xerxes. But Esther can't simply approach the king. She has to wait to be summoned by him. So Esther's wise. What's the first thing that she does? This God-fearing Jewish woman. Let's turn to Esther chapter 4 and verses 12 to 14. And this short passage is perhaps the most well-known of the verses in the book of Esther. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, I can't go to the king. He sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. God's plan is being worked out. Esther's being placed in this position of power for the purpose of saving her people. You know, in her past, Mordecai has told her what to do and how to behave. But now Esther makes the plan. This is Esther's plan. And what does she do? It starts with God. Esther replies to Mordecai. This is chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, it's the capital of the empire, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, day or night, I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther's demonstrating her wisdom by starting her plan in prayer. The word prayer isn't used. We use the word fasting uh, in the book. But in that culture, fasting and prayer would be together. And the prayer of Esther isn't recorded in the book of Esther. But our Holy Scripture is full of great prayers and petitions to God. We won't do this now, but if you want to uh, turn to Nehemiah, that's the book just before Esther, and look at chapter 1 you'll see Nehemiah's great prayer to God. Or you could listen to the talk that Glendale Church offered on January the 24th. You'll find it on the website when we studied that prayer. Esther reveals her wisdom through prayer and patience. She doesn't rush to engineer an appearance in front of King Xerxes, but he invites Xerxes and Haman 
to a series of banquets before she makes her request. How many times do we fools rush in? Esther accepts the culture, the customs, and the behaviors expected of her in her society. And this allows time for God's work to be done. She and her people and Mordecai have prayed and fasted and allows time for God's work to happen. And in the intervening days between these banquets, God softens the heart of King Xerxes. The king knows there's something on Esther's mind. And when she finally makes her request, God's timing is right for that request to be granted. Proverbs 25, verse 15. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, but a gentle tongue, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. Esther's humility, her wisdom, and her approach to this great request that she'd been given sees the king issuing a decree that allows the Jewish people to defend themselves when the plot actually occurs. And through prayer and courage and wisdom, Esther influences the king and God's plan happens. God's plan is revealed and of course the story ends mostly happily with Mordecai being elevated to Haman's position, number two in the kingdom. And unlike Haman, Mordecai rules fairly and honestly and to great acclaim. When you read the book of Esther, you won't see the word God. You won't see the word the Lord. But throughout the book, God's plan and his love for his people is revealed. Esther is a godly woman. Mordecai is a godly man. They go about things through prayer and through petition and in the right way. And the little things that Esther does make a great impact on the nation of Israel. Her life's experiences equipped her to do great, great things in the name of the Lord. And that same God, that same God, that eternal God, is alive and working in each of us. We too can do great things. God even if he's not mentioned in the book, or we don't feel him right now, is doing great things. This is what God promised to his people in Exodus 6, verses 7 and 8. It was true then at the beginning of the Exodus, and it's true for each of us now. God says, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, who brought you safety in the time of the Persian Empire, who works in our lives right now, right today. And I will bring you to the land that I promised, I swore with uphand, uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to A. Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession, for I am the Lord. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We say you are our God and we are your people. Teach us, equip us, Lord, to feel your presence and to do the little things in our walks of life 
in our walk of faith to reveal you to those around us. Let us remember those qualities of Esther and how she faithfully served you and her people. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.